So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this first of uh, many monthly sessions uh, and conversations in professional development for eCampus Alberta. My name is Randy Labonte, and I coordinate these monthly series on behalf of Tricia Donovan and the rest of the crew at eCampus Alberta and you as members. I know many of the folks that are here are very familiar. Good to see you. This is me, and I'll turn off the webcam after. Um, just as a heads up on the monthly series, we're now second Tuesday of the month, and we are looking for additional conversations and lead conversationalists, uh, shall we say, for upcoming sessions. So please feel free to email me uh, at your uh, your pleasure, uh, and I'll just put my email address here, and Gmail is the fastest way to get me um, for that with any ideas and suggestions that you may have for potential presentations as we uh, as we pull them together for uh, for December, January, and through into the spring. So it's my pleasure today to introduce a friend, a colleague, and uh, a mentor and an inspirer to, to a, a very large extent, uh, Paul Stacey. Uh, Paul is uh, probably one of the more thoughtful and reflective uh, thinkers in my personal learning network and uh, my connections, and it's a real pleasure to have Paul here to share some of his expertise. Uh, now, well over a full year into his journey with Creative Commons. So, uh, really looking forward to what Paul's going to exchange with us and looking forward to some continued dialogue and conversation about uh, Creative Commons and open resources and open education as we carry on through our monthly series. So, without further ado, let me introduce Paul and let him take it from here. Oh, well, thanks for that, Randy. Great to be here and nice to be part of the eCampus Alberta webinar series. Here I am. I'll just put the camera on for a minute so you get to see me. Um, as Randy said, I just uh, joined Creative Commons about a year ago. I'm actually based in Vancouver, and many of you might know me from the work that I did for years at BC Campus where I led an open education resource initiative starting in 2003. So we got a nice little group here today. I welcome questions at any time throughout this whole talk. Um, going to focus on Creative Commons and the future of education. And maybe as I get underway, you could just put into the chat message box how familiar you are with Creative Commons or any or perhaps any questions that you might have that could shape this talk. I'm happy to take it in any direction that might suit your needs. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I figured that some of you would be like Randy, somewhat familiar of Creative Commons, but perhaps not totally familiar. And um, what I thought I'd do with today's session is first kind of uh, give a little summary snapshot of what Creative Commons is all about, and then um, I want to actually have an opportunity to take you into an interactive part of the session where we'll actually get you engaged in looking at and searching for open education resources. And we'll talk about that whole process and what it's like and how to find stuff. And then I also will conclude with some, some short comments about the future and where this is all going and what it might look like, particularly as we move from thinking of open education in terms of content and resources and moving to thinking about it in terms of teaching and learning. Well, great. It's good to see some people have their feet wet and, well, some people even have the t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> I should have worn my t-shirt today. Um, so here's the big picture on Creative Commons. It's a nonprofit. It's actually based in Mountain View, just south of San Francisco. That's where headquarters is. And I work for headquarters, but I'm based here in Vancouver. And the whole idea behind Creative Commons is to um, find a way to enable the sharing and reuse of resources that everyone's developing these days in the digital arena. And to do that, we've created some technologies and licenses. The diagram here in the middle sort of shows the scope or areas of impact that Creative Commons is involved with. And while our talk today will primarily focus on the education vertical, you can see that we also are very involved and used in science and data, in culture, especially in culture, in government and philanthropy, and in media and platforms. And the 
The two green parts at the bottom represent our core expertise. We basically, as a nonprofit, have to engage in fundraising, much like Wikipedia. But our core area of expertise is around these technology products, the legal licenses, and their use and supporting people in their use. And, and to do that, we have a whole global network and a whole focus on policy. So that's the kind of big picture about Creative Commons. Well, we have a headquarters um, in Silicon Valley. We actually have a global network of about 74 affiliates around the world. You can see in the top right-hand corner that Canada also has a Creative Commons affiliate. So creativecommons.ca is where you can find the, the Canadian affiliate. And these affiliates essentially represent Creative Commons around the world, support users in adopting Creative Commons licenses, and act as advocates and provide salons and professional development opportunities. So it's really become a global activity. And, and I suppose for those of you that are wondering why I would leave BC campus, campus which was such a great gig, and, and move to Creative Commons, one of the reasons was the opportunity to work on education globally as opposed to just provincially. I created Commons about 10 years old. So 10 years ago, things were a bit different, of course. As you know, all of us that are uh, content creators, everything by default is locked down by copyright. And so Creative Commons was uh, birthed, if you will, 10 years ago, essentially to find a way to legally open up and allow people to share resources if they want to. And so uh, Lawrence Lessig, one of the founders, uh, helped create Creative Commons 10 years ago and modeled it very much off of the open source software industry. Similarly to open source software, the Creative Commons initiative largely revolves around these licenses. And, and I'm showing all six Creative Commons licenses on this one page, starting at the top with the most permission-based license, which we call CC BY. And all CC BY requires is that another user who's making use of a work that's been licensed with a CC BY license uh, give attribution to the original creator. Uh, that's the most free or the most permissive license in our repertoire. And as we go down this stack, they get more and more less permissive, fewer freedoms. Uh, the second one down is uh, CC BY share alike. So not only do you have to uh, provide attribution, but if you reuse and remix and modify a work that's been licensed with this license, you actually have to share it back and provide access to everyone who, who is interested in that resource under the same license terms. Third license down is no derivatives. This simply means that a piece of uh, creation or a work has been created, but it has to be used as is. No, no modifying, no remixing is allowed. Fourth one down is non-commercial, meaning that a work has been created and it's being shared, but it cannot be used for profit. So you're welcome to reuse and remix and so on, but not for commercial purposes. And then the last two are simply um, variations. So non-commercial share alike or non-commercial no derivatives. I would have to say that um, in, the, in the education context, the intent with licensing education resources with a Creative Commons license is to enable as much reuse and repurposing of that work as possible. And in that context, any Creative Commons license that prevents derivatives tends not to be thought of as suitable for education because all of us in education, of course, like to customize and modify our educational resources to suit the way we, uh, to suit the way we teach, to suit our understanding of our academic domain, and to reflect our own kind of unique spin on the topic that we're teaching about. There's three parts to the Creative Commons licenses, a, a kind of legal code, which is the sort of full license that a lawyer would love to read. Um, the, the middle part, which is the human readable deed, this is sort of explains what the license does in plain, simple English that anyone can understand. And then the top piece, the metadata piece, is the actual piece of code that when you apply a license using the Creative Commons license chooser, 
it actually embeds a little piece of code onto the resource so that search engines can find it. So the, the uh, Creative Commons licenses have been essentially designed for the digital era and to be search engine compatible, but of course can also be applied to paper and print based products. So with these licenses, essentially we're moving from an era where everything was locked down under copyright, all rights reserved, to an era where creators now actually have some choice. They basically have the choice to, they still hold copyright to everything that they create, but they have the choice of making something available for others to use. So they have the choice to share. And that sharing through these licenses is essentially made easy and legal. And there's a whole set of icons, as you saw in some of the previous slides, and as is shown here on this slide, that indicate the, the, um, the kind of meaning behind many of these licenses. And amazingly, oh, after 10 years, I mean, one of the things that's happened is that the commons has just really started to explode and flourish. If we go back to 2003, you know, with the launch of the MIT Open Courseware, they now have 2,000 plus of their courses up online, all licensed with Creative Commons. The Khan Academy is also licensed with Creative Commons. Wikipedia uses CC by SA. YouTube actually gives, um, people who are producing videos the option to act, to have a license, a Creative Commons license put on their work rather than the standard YouTube license. And perhaps the biggest media platform at all that uses the Creative Commons license is Flickr with over 250 million photos put up by photographers around the world, all willing to share their work. And more and more of these kinds of resources are being put up every day. There's a few links that I wanted to share with folks that uh, you might find interesting for those of you that are interested in tracking the adoption of Creative Commons by all sectors, not just education, but science and data and culture and platforms and government. Um, I just put a link into the chat which takes you to our news blog and I should also say that we're we're on um, Facebook, which is another, I actually track both these things myself because I often learn some amazing stuff through both these sites. And as Randy was talking about Twitter earlier, we also tweet at Creative Commons is our, our tweet tag. So you can find uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of news related to Creative Commons and uh, see some fascinating examples of how others are using Creative Commons through these sources. But let's jump in now and talk about the future. There's, 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 a, there's been a kind of 10-year uh, foundation established around the use of these licenses. And now as we move forward into the next two years, the two areas of biggest impact in education specifically that Creative Commons is having are for open education resources and for open access. So let's talk about both those things for a moment. Um, from an open access point of view, the open access really is referencing research articles. And so here's the current funding cycle that governments go through for creating research articles, getting research done and for getting research articles published. So usually there's some sort of government RFP or award made for uh, research in the form of a grant. Then the, the research is conducted and papers get written. They're submitted to a journal and peer-reviewed, and usually if they're, if they're accepted in a journal, and usually at that point, the author actually transfers copyright to publishers, um, on not very well-known aspect of this whole cycle. The articles then get published in what are primarily closed journals. The library then has to subscribe, and the public will have to pay for a per-article fee to see the articles in the journal of that publisher. And as a result, the public's granted little or no reuse rights beyond access to read articles. And even to read them, you'd have to go to a library that has subscribed to that particular journal. And we think as a result, there's slow scientific progress and a kind of poor return on public investment through this process. And, and it's not only us who think that, increasingly government grantees, grant grant funders are also thinking that way. So here in Canada, of course, we've got uh, NSERC, SHRC, and, and the um, 
the health front, health council, both of all three of those are now planning to adopt open access requirements associated with their research grants. And uh, health actually went first, so the Canadian Institute of Health Research went first and has had a bit of an open access policy for some time, but now NSERC and SHRC are going to follow suit and are developing this tri-agency open access policy. And what an open access policy would look like then is a kind of more optimized funding cycle for research articles. So the same thing would happen at the start. The government would put out an RFP or would make a research grant award, but they would put in place some open license requirements right up front. So if that research gets done, the paper gets written, it gets submitted to journals and peer review occurs. And then acceptance in the journal would require either a public access policy that um, means that the article is published in a gold open access process, meaning that the journal itself is open access, or that it is that the article is put in an actual repository of some kind, either held by the institution or even by the author. But typically the article would get published in a, in a journal and most of the open access policies that research funders are putting in place are allowing for some kind of embargo period, usually in the, era, in the range of six to 12 months before it must be openly available. But once it becomes openly available through the public or through an open repository, then uh, anyone can download that article, anyone can read it, and the public is granted full reuse rights under the terms of those open licenses. And, and we think as a result, there would be an accelerated scientific progress and a much greater return on public investment. One of the things underlying this whole push towards openly licensing uh, research articles is ensuring that the public and the economy, all small businesses, have access to this research so that they can fuel uh, growth, fuel innovation, and kind of boost, give, give, give a boost to the whole economy. So, I mean, that's a real quick little snapshot on the open access side, and I just would say, here in Canada, there's definitely a lot of talk about open access as we talk about the three government agencies. In the, in the U.S., it's even greater, the uh, move towards open access and also in the U.K. So I think Canada, the U.S., U.K. are all very actively pursuing an open access strategy in education when it comes to research. I want to switch now, though, to talk about the primary reason why many of you are probably here, which is around open educational resources. And so. I, I thought it might be useful to first of all establish what we mean when we're talking about open education resources. So essentially teaching, learning, research resources that are either in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits them to be freely used and repurposed by others. And, and op open education resources can be a complete course or it can be a course component such as a textbook or a video or an animation simulation. They come in all shapes and all sizes. But there is a core concept behind open education resources, and that is what we often in the field refer to as the four R's. So open education resources are published under an open license that lets someone else reuse them, revise them, remix them, and redistribute them. So all, all four of those four R's need to be in place for it to be really considered an open education resource. And when we think about the licenses that uh, I was showing you earlier, as I said then, anything that specifies no derivatives, in other words, that prevents you from revising or remixing, tends not to be considered an open education resource. Still good though, still good to use as is, but not really an open education resource. And so similarly, what we're seeing with open education resources is another shift in the way funding happens in education, a shift from funding being provided to institutions and to faculty where education resources are produced, where typically education resources that are produced under the current regime are very rarely limit, very rarely peer reviewed or if they are peer-reviewed, it's usually constrained to the grantee's institution. The copyright would rest with the faculty member or the institution, depending upon the policy, with no obligation to share. 
and typically the content would only be used at that one institution and the public would not even know about these education resources and certainly not be granted any rights to reuse them. And while this has been the long-held practice, it's actually slowing learning and again generating a rather poor return on investment. So the alternative and the practice that we're seeing adopted really in many parts of the world now is that when funding is provided to an institution or to faculty, typically it also now will have some sort of open license requirement. So the grant gets awarded, the education resources get produced, and usually because, they open, because the resource is openly licensed and put out publicly, it ends up being peer-reviewed broadly by, by peers well beyond the walls of your own institution. Even though copyright will rest with you, all the resources get openly licensed and content can be used not only in your institution but at other institutions well beyond your borders. And because it's openly licensed and publicly out there, the public knows about it, the public is granted full reuse rights, and this will generate accelerated learning and increase the return on public investment. As many of my colleagues like to say, buy one, get one is the whole motto behind some of this open education resource initiative in the sense that publicly funds should result in a publicly accessible good. There's lots of examples of this. I currently am working um, on a large initiative in the U.S. This is funded by the Department of Labor. It's called the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Program. There's a mouthful and a big acronym for you. Um, this is really a $2 billion program. This is the largest OER initiative in the world. It's, it's uh, releasing about $500 million of grants per year to community colleges. And the community colleges are being asked to create stackable and latticed credentials that can be completed in two years or less and create um, a pool of graduates who are transitioning from being kind of unemployed to being scaled up such that they have higher level skills and can work in high growth industry sectors in states all across the U.S. But interestingly, for the $2 billion of funding being provided, all of the new uh, development that colleges do with this program must be licensed for the Creative Commons CC BY license, making it an open educational resource for sure. And in British Columbia, many of you may be aware of the Open Textbooks Initiative. Um, where the government of British Columbia through the Ministry of Advanced Education has agreed to fund open textbooks, meaning a textbook that is replacing a publisher's textbook and is uh, licensed openly for the top 40 courses in the BC public post-secondary system, top 40 enrolled courses. So they're looking to generate a high impact uh, by picking the highest enrolled courses. And in fact, BC just announced an additional fund to support a further 20 books in some of the vocational areas. And, and so um, as we see the open textbook space roll out, one of the fun aspects of it is that really what's happening is that uh, open textbooks are reducing the costs for students. And as we look at the level of debt being carried by students here in Canada and beyond, it's really quite astronomical the amount of money that students are, have in debt. And so there's a big emphasis on reducing costs to students and open textbooks very much uh, leading the way in terms of reducing the cost for students because a, a typical textbook is somewhere between 150, 200 bucks per course and you total that up across a, a school year and it can be quite a lot of money. The cool thing about the, um, the, the Open Textbook Initiative at BC campus is that they're very much focused on, on whether they can actually just find existing open textbooks and simply reuse them rather than offering new open textbooks from scratch. So there's a very strong emphasis on first finding a textbook and then adopting that textbook if it's been peer reviewed by faculty in British Columbia and they think it's worthy. And then if they can't find an open textbook that 
that can be used as is, can they find one that's 80% there or 90% there or even 70% there? Because that's still an incredible, very rarely is a textbook perfectly good in its entirety for any particular course. And so the cool thing about open textbooks, because they're openly licensed, they can be revised and, and adapted to better fit a particular faculty member's understanding of their course and their academic field. And here's where I want to actually spend some time you now. I've been doing all the talking and I, I, I'd rather have this be a slightly interactive session for the next little while. So I'd like to take you now to um, a particular website that I put together that is intended to help faculty find OER. So I'm just actually going to, um, I think I'll do this as a web tour. Let's see here. Actually, I'll put the link first of all in the chat session so that you guys can go there directly just by clicking on the link. And, um, and I'm actually going to change my screen to show this particular website. So um, this particular website has been developed with the particular emphasis on helping faculty find open education resources. This is one of the most recurring themes that I hear when I speak to faculty around the world, and that is how hard it is to find open education resources. So I put together this page to basically help save time and effort around finding resources, and you're welcome to scroll down it and explore it. Um, the way this page is structured, it's structured in two big sections. Most faculty, when I first speak to faculty about open education resources, most faculty are simply looking for an individual media element that they'll use within their course. It might be a photo or a graphic or a video or some audio. And what they're looking for is something that is openly licensed in a way that freely permits their use of it without them having to ask for permission or figure out whether it meets fair use and without them actually, you know, not paying attention to any of those legal issues, simply uh, making use of an openly licensed resource. So I, I structured this first part of the page to allow you to jump directly to the kind of thing you're looking for. Um, I should point out that many people initially start out looking for open education resources just using Google, let's say. And so there is, as you'll see on this page, a general search capability that does let you make use of Google, and you're welcome to click on this as I'm talking. So feel free to click on Google Advanced Search, and you'll see at the bottom of the Google Advanced Search page that you can actually uh, specify that you would like to do a search uh, for, to find things that you can freely use, or to, to find things that you can freely use even for commercial purposes. So. In it, before you start your Google search, if you want to limit your search to simply finding things that are openly licensed, you can actually set some of those attributes in the advanced search section of Google. I recommend you do that, so it's setting the usage rights parameters to be free to use, share, or modify, and, uh, and then do your search, and it will return to you things that have been openly licensed. Even so, even with that, you'll still generate a large volume of material, but at least it gets you started down the path of finding things that have been openly licensed. Um, for photos and images, um, which is perhaps the number one thing that faculty tell me they're looking for, um, I really recommend Wikimedia Commons. So again, if you're following along with me and want to click on Wikimedia Commons, uh, go ahead and and check that out. Um, if you do a search for something like, um, let's say, mitosis, if you search for mitosis in Wikimedia Commons, you'll be taken to some great diagrams that show you all the phases of mitosis. And again, those are openly licensed. You're free to use them, simply giving attribution. Flickr um, is, is by far the largest source of photos. And so if you go to Flickr.com or click the link here or go to Flickr.com slash Creative Commons, you'll see all the photos that have been licensed with Creative Commons that are freely available for you to reuse. And, and if you do the Flickr.com slash Creative Commons, 
you'll see that they actually organize the photos based on which of the licenses uh, a creator has attached to their photo. So you can actually um, look for particularly licensed photos. Again, I think that for me at least the more useful aspect of finding something in Flickr is to use the Flickr advanced search. And when you use the Flickr advanced search, um, you'll see that that you can actually again set the um, set the attributes to search for just what you're looking for um, and and exclude everything else. So if you're involved in something that uh, requires commercial use, for example, you can actually set the um, set the attributes to allow you to find that kind of content. You can also use the Google Images. There's Pixabay, Open Clip Art Library. I'm scrolling down my long page here. I actually really like the Noun Project. This is a web new website came out this year that is a platform that's essentially building a visual language of icons and symbols. So it's not photos, but it's icons and symbols, which um, turn out to be incredibly useful in presentations and in website designs. And those. Uh, Symbols and icons are openly licensed, many of them with Creative Commons, and the Noun Project is uh, actually turning out to be one of the most popular uh, sources for that kind of image. I should mention too that um, under this Photos and Images section, I did put in the Public Library of Science or PLOS. This is an open access journal that's focused on science and medicine. But and so this is really research articles, but every research article they publish is open access. And that means that the not only is the written content licensed with Creative Commons, but so are the images. And so if you're looking for images, tables, or graphs, um, a really good source of it, if you can find directly the kind of journal, open access journal that is in your field, is to go to the journal and find something that specifically relates to what you'd like to show, a real example. And also, finally, in this section on photos and images, many of the world's museums, libraries, and archives, so galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, which we call at Creative Commons glam, not, not glam in the way of fashion, but glam in the way of culture. So it's an acronym meaning galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Many of them now are recognizing the importance of making their collections available to the public digitally. And so Europeana is a good example of digital resources from across Europe's museums, libraries, and archives. Uh, things like paintings and drawings and maps and photos. And um, many of them are openly licensed, but not all of them. And, and increasingly, though, we're seeing museum after museum move in this direction and for its collection, making it publicly available and the images publicly available. So uh, that's a very popular source of finding images. On the video side, I mentioned YouTube. And I hope, um, so while I'm talking, one of, the things, one of the things I'm hoping is that you guys are exploring and not just listening to me talk, but exploring while I'm talking. And uh, I, I would like to hear back from you when I finish talking, oh good, so I can see Rhonda is and uh, Jim is and so th that's great. So I'm hoping you'll um, send back to me when I get to the end here some of the things that you found that are useful for you so that I get some feedback that this has been useful. On the, on the, YouTube, on the video side, um, again, there's a ton of sources of openly licensed video. Um, I mentioned YouTube earlier. And so you can use youtube.com slash creative commons to see the creative commons licensed videos. And also if you're using the YouTube editor, so YouTube has its own video editor where you can remix and uh, mash up a bunch of different videos. In the YouTube video editor, you can actually specify that you want to only find content available under a creative commons license and then it will only show you YouTube videos that have been licensed that way. And of course, you can also just do general YouTube searches for Creative Commons licensed video that you can then embed right in your courseware. Vimeo um, actually does an even better job than YouTube from my point of view in terms of letting you easily post and find videos that have been licensed with Creative Commons. 
the Internet Archive, I, you know, it's one of my favorite um, collections of old video and movie footage. You can find everything from old cartoons to ephemeral films to news footage to actually the other day I used, they have some really cool videos from uh, driving intermissions. Remember those little things that would say it's time to go to the to the food kiosk and get some popcorn? I used um, a video chunk from the Internet Car Archive that had been openly licensed in one of my presentations the other day. TED Talks are all Creative Commons licensed, CC BY and CND. Al Jazeera, so we're increasingly starting to see some video from news uh, news agencies being openly licensed. So Al Jazeera is kind of an interesting example where the video footage they produce as part of their news coverage is, is available to be downloaded, shared, and remixed um, by others. And so they were really uh, the first news broadcaster to release news footage under a CC attribution license. Okay, I'm going to just keep going here. It's a little bit longer on that. So this is all individual little media elements. And uh, the next section looks at audio and music, which is just an exploding space in terms of musicians increasingly taking ownership over how their music gets distributed. So Gemendo, CC Mixter, Free Music Archive, SoundCloud, these are all platforms that allow musicians to upload their music and all allow the musicians to attach a Creative Commons license to their music. So many musicians are choosing to Creative Commons license their music as a means for getting their music freely and legally distributed to as many listeners as possible, knowing that the way that they actually will earn funds or revenue or earn a living is by giving live performances or selling um, uh, selling uh, associated goods that that go along with the music that they're promoting. So, uh, and, and SoundCloud is particularly cool uh, because it allows you to. I don't know if you've looked at SoundCloud, but if I was to look at one, look at SoundCloud because when you're playing a song a song back in SoundCloud. One of the neat things it does is it allows listeners to embed comments at any point during the song. So while you're listening to the song, you can actually uh, not only hear the song, but see comments that other listeners have embedded within that song. All right, so uh, that's a whirlwind tour of, um, of finding openly licensed media elements that it covers everything from general searches to finding pictures to finding videos to finding audio and sound. But for those that want to go beyond that and search for, like all of that content was authored by creators. I mean, we would consider most of that content to be part of the culture sector. It's a sort of, sort of enabling all of us to be uh, cultural producers, to participate freely in culture. But of course, in education, we often would prefer or are intentionally looking for content that has been designed with educational intent, whereas the, the whole media element stuff may or may not have been designed with any education intent in mind, but of course could be useful for us when we're teaching a particular topic related to that. But if you want to find content that has been authored by other educators, well, then we get into the education search part of this page. So, um, again, you could be searching for stuff just in general or for full courses or textbooks or tests and assessments. There's a whole array of open education resource content that's been authored by educators for educators. Um, OER Commons is a good general search engine that allows you to search across a large number of collections and items. And the other thing I like about OER Commons is that it also allows you to specify the subject area that you want to search within or to specify also the grade level. So it, it not only does higher ed but does K-12. So you can actually search through OER Commons and, and narrow down the search for something that specifically meets your needs. 
Um, the Florida Orange Grove Digital Repository is also um, a pretty good um, repository containing education resources, openly licensed education resources from K to 12 and post secondary. That uh, that it, that interestingly can you know you can download them right out of the Orange Grove Digital Repository, or you can simply uh, kind of link to them or integrate them with your learning management system, which we also did at, at BC Campus with the Solar Repository when I was there. So you don't even necessarily have to download the resource from these repositories. You can simply create a link from within your learning management system that that calls that resource from the repository and displays it within your learning management system. Um, one of the things about open education resources is that they, of course, have corresponded with an explosion in online learning and the use of education technology. And I totally applaud this direction, although I am still searching for and hoping for a significant pedagogical innovation. Uh, the low hanging common denominator among many institutions has simply been to record their lectures or put up video tutorials um, that simply emulate what they've always done on campus in terms of the didactic uh, format of giving lectures. But that often still can provide a good source of resources. So if you want courses that have lectures that have been recorded from Yale or from MIT or Berkeley, those are all um, being posted up online by those, by those respective um, institutions and many others, I should point out. Uh, but this is just a little sampling, um, and those are all openly licensed. The Khan Academy is one of the most amazing sources of videos covering math, biology, chemistry, and physics, and is increasingly diversifying their collection to look at the humanities and history and finance. But I'd say that the thing that we all started out knowing them for is math. Um, they're not so much recorded lectures, it's like short little 10 minute tutorials on a particular topic. Um, and uh, I was just at an event with the Khan Academy and they were profiling what they're about to roll out. Um, and they're going to create uh, really interesting methods for students to take on challenges. Um, and so you'll be able to take on what they call a mission. And a mission will include uh, making your way through a variety of Khan Academy resources successfully. Uh, they're also going to map all of the math resources in the Khan Academy to the U.S. Common Core Math standards, which are, are being rolled out across the states now for things like uh, math and English. Open textbooks, I alluded to earlier, uh, I would say that open textbooks are currently the hot topic in, op in the open education space. Um, I mentioned the BC Campus Initiative is also an initiative in Washington State, one in Oregon now at Oregon State University, and another one in California. So for some reason, the Pacific West Coast is like a hotbed of open textbooks. Um, and I would say that the premier source of open textbooks currently is the OpenStax College Collection. They really are producing high quality, free open textbooks that have been peer reviewed and are, that are just as good as anything that you could get from a publisher. They're available free online, so you can actually get them online. You can actually download the PDF from OpenStax College. Uh, but if you actually want a printed version, a paper version that's bound, you're going to have to pay a small fee. But it's nowhere near the cost of, uh, of what we've been buying books from publishers from. Siabula, I, I, I really like Siabula, um, although they are not North American, they're actually based in South Africa. Um, they have a really amazing process for authoring open textbooks and have developed some great open textbooks for math and science. Um, I was just speaking to Megan Beckett and Mark Horner from Siabula last week and they had some amazing news about the open textbooks that they authored for grades four and five being adopted by the Ministry of Education for the entire nation who printed out a hard copy and made it available to every child in every school in that country. 
that's one of these uh, ways of uh, enhancing the education offering at a very affordable and much lower cost than they've been getting from publishers. Um, there's other CK12 boundless is also a really cool model. Simulations, um, FET um, is a really great source of simulations for physics, especially. And then if we want modular course components, connections would be a great place. Merlot has is always been around for quite a while and is increasingly openly licensing its resources. Um, and then when we get down, I'm just going to skip right down to the bottom where we're getting into complete courses. So if you are not searching for a, a media element or a course component but want an entire course, there are those available too. And so I've just listed here a variety of sources for completely online full courses from the Carnegie Mellon OLI initiative, which I've been working with, to Washington State's Open Course Library, where they developed uh, online courses for the 81 highest enrolled college courses across their system. Um, and they, they challenged faculty to do so for less, for, for a cost that would be less than $30 for students and have uh, been tracking the results of that and now up into the millions of dollars saved. And sailor.org is also really starting to develop a large collection of both college level courses and open textbooks. Um, not only college, but K-12, but I know most of today's audience is going to be college. So so that's, a, I, I, I mean, I'm actually going to update this because I have some additional ones that I want to add to this page. But I wanted to provide a one-stop destination for, uh, for faculty to find open education resources no matter what kind they're looking for. And, and I can see that, uh, that uh, eCampus Alberta also has some, some links. And I, I know it's a comprehensive list. Um, so I'm going to stop talking just for a sec. We still have 10 minutes to go and just kind of invite you to, um, to put into the, the chat uh, anything that you found that you thought was pretty cool during this whirlwind tour. Or, and I'll just take a moment to scroll up and see if there are particular questions. Any questions, Randy, that I should attend to right away? Just while people are chatting to me about what they found. Yeah, uh, Paul, nothing that uh, flowed by. I think people were, were out, out in a boot um, <laughs> checking out some of those resources. And uh, just in case they didn't pull them from the uh, <clears throat> the web tour, I did uh, copy and paste the, the URLs that you pointed out into the text chat as well. And for folks um, as well, this is probably the one page you do want to bookmark. You can copy and paste the URL. We'll stick it back in the text chat area again. But questions of Paul? Okay, yeah, so this is a great question about um, how do publishers feel about open textbooks? Um, I, I would say, Bonnie, that publishers are not happy about open textbooks just in general. Um, but on the other hand, publishers have kind of dug themselves a hole through, uh, through some um, not so pleasant practices of putting out new editions constantly, really pricing their books up at a very high margin. The actual profits of publishers far exceeds any other industry sector um, in the education space and has been far exceeding that for many, many years. I would say that publishers, while initially were very upset and determined to stop open education resources and to stop open textbooks, they, they have uh, increasingly realized that the writing's on the wall and that this is a bit of a disintermediation similarly, or similar to what happened with music and are increasingly now trying to find out how they can still play a role in this space and are looking to make a move into the digital arena, um, I would say that the reception of many to their e-textbooks or to the e-supplemental materials has been mixed. And I say mixed because very few people appreciate the time bombing that many publishers put on these digital resources where you have access to it for a limited period of time, perhaps while you're taking that course, and then after that, you no longer have access to it, so you're basically just renting it from them rather than owning it. There's a bunch of practices there that I think publishers are, are needing to address. 
I, I would say that at Creative Commons, we are actively involved in speaking with publishers and trying to encourage them to uh, find a role for themselves and figure out what that help them figure out what that role is. I do think that publishers will continue to be around, but perhaps not in quite the same way. Uh, the time bombing, I can see a question there is uh, still, um, you know, t time bombing is essentially a practice intended to maximize your money. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I think that, yeah, it's, I don't think it makes sense either. I think, though, that if you want to look at um, maximizing the return and getting as many users as possible, then um, it's, it's the same phenomena as, say, um, Blockbuster, you know, renting a video for a three or four days. Um, mind you, look what just happened with Blockbuster. That maybe it's not a good example. Um, I just have a few minutes and I, I wanted to close this session by speaking about the thing that really interests me now. So I've been totally immersed in this open education space for quite a long time, since 2003. And the part that now excites me is really around the pedagogy side. So, so I think it's great that we have, through open education resources and open access journals, the opportunity to replace closed proprietary materials with open materials. And, and I also think that, that it's great that the open license allows us to localize, contextualize, and keep those resources current. But I would really, really advocate that we begin to think about what the teaching and learning possibilities are associated with these open resources. What is it that we can do from a teaching and learning pedagogy point of view that we couldn't do when we had closed proprietary resources? And I'll simply say two things. First of all, I really suggest that we begin to rethink what I call and what David Wiley calls disposable assignments. Disposable assignments, we're all familiar with them. You issue a test, the student does that test or assignment, they hand it in, they get a mark, and they basically put it on the shelf or throw it away. That's the end of that assignment. I think that's an incredible waste, and when we're dealing with open education resources, we do not need to teach that way. We need to think about student assignments as contributing to a global public good. Can we get students engaged in, as part of their learning process, producing works that serve a social need well beyond the four walls of the classroom that are no longer simply throwaways that they complete and dispose of? You have and a chat. Two examples. I don't have time to get into this part. Maybe Randy will invite me back for another webinar at some future where we'll just talk about pedagogy. But here's two examples. Um, John Beasley Murray at the University of British Columbia challenged his class, this is actually going back now to 2008, to address the Wikipedia article that dealt with Spanish literature, and, or Latin America's literature, and to, to basically, he basically challenged his class to improve that Wikimedia, Wikipedia article to such an extent that it would be a featured article on the, whole, on the main page of Wikipedia. And um, and so this uh, ended up being called Murder, Madness, and Ma'am, and the students poured themselves into this activity well beyond the marks that it was actually worth and succeeded tremendously converting what was a rather lackluster Wikipedia article into a stellar Wikipedia article with hugely extensive references at the end that substantiate everything that got written. That's an example of having students, as an assignment, they did all that work for marks, produce a public good that everyone benefits from. That is not a disposable assignment. That is a significant uh, contribution to the public good. A slightly different variation on that is the DS-106 assignment bank. Now, DS-106 is an online course a uh, MOOC um, that is about digital storytelling and culture. The uh, Jim Groom, who teaches this course, has a very interesting approach to assignments. Essentially, the students, as a part of taking this course, must create an assignment for other students. All student-created assignments are put into the assignment bank, which you can see an image of here and the link to it. And when you are a student enrolled in DS-106 as part of your study, 
you have to complete a certain number of assignments out of the assignment bank. And this moves assignments away from being authored in a kind of confidential, secret way by faculty never to be shown to students, to having assignments be developed by students and posted in a large assignment bank openly to other students who could actually look at all the assignments even before enrolling in that course. And clearly, the volume of assignments in the assignment bank is so large that no one student could possibly you know, do all the assignments and somehow cheat or, or um, you know, rig their uh, accomplishments in this course. So uh, I just, these are just two small examples, but I'm really advocating for us to think about open education resources in a teaching and learning context and move ourselves away to fully engaging students in the process of creating really significant works. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk about just the, um, the whole area of MOOCs and what's going on from a teaching and learning point of view. Um, this is a little diagram created by Julia Forsyth um, uh, on a talk that Terry Anderson from Athabasca University gave, which really looks at sort of the three generations of learning that, that we've had. So the first generation was largely this kind of objectivist and behaviorist method of teaching. The second method of teaching and learning, which began to really take hold during the heyday of when online learning was starting to develop, was constructivism, social constructivism. And now with the, with the CMOOCs especially, we've had connectivism from George Siemens be a really popular consideration for how to do teaching and learning. And so what's been interesting is that as the MOOCs have exploded onto the scene, um, the big MOOCs from, say, Stanford and MIT and Yale and others have been largely based on really old school teaching and learning methods that do not leverage online and do not leverage openness. In fact, when we look at how open MOOCs really are, it turns out that massive open online courses, the open part of the MOOC is simply enrollments. MOOCs are open to anyone to enroll, but they're not open in any other way. So edX and Coursera are all closed. No uh, openly licensing of resources in those platforms. And uh, Udacity has uh, chosen a Creative Commons license, but chose a non-derivatives one. So while there's some open license associated with some of the materials, you can't change anything. I think the European ones on the right, Future Learn and Open Up Ed, will be interesting because they are going in a more open way beyond just simply open to enrollment. And so it'll be interesting as we see the, um, you know, the acceptance and use of MOOCs continue to grow, whether there'll be some uh, differentiation in the marketplace based on how open a MOOC really is. Last slide, um, I wanted to suggest as well that um, in addition to thinking about how open education resources affect teaching and learning, we need to also begin to think about the policy aspects of this. And so at Creative Commons, we've done a lot of work on open policy. And open policy simply referring to what policies need to be put in place at either a national level, a provincial level, an institutional level, or even at a departmental or faculty individual level that can foster and facilitate openness in education. Um, Creative Commons has an OER policy registry with over 82 current and proposed open education policies from around the world. So those that are looking at creating policies have some templates and some examples that they can look at. And we're just, uh, Creative Commons is just about to launch an open policy network, which is intended to bring together um, those who are engaged in either government or in institutions in devising open policy and to uh, uh, network together all of those that are doing so in order to best leverage the opportunities for open policy, which rarely come along and need to be maximized when they do. So that's it. Uh, thank you for joining me. This has been a bit of a whirlwind. I feel like I spoke too fast without necessarily having much engagement with any of you. 
but um, from my point of view, the openness in education is really helping us build the future of education together. And I hope you all join in, join in doing so. Wow, thank you, Paul. I, I have to say that was <laughs> that was whirlwind and amazing. But uh, yeah, I'm, if you're available, uh, folks uh, th that do have to run to other meetings, um, by all means, feel free to do so. But stick around for some Q&A as, as well. And I've got a couple of comments as, uh, as well about uh, the site, just so uh, while I have people before you dash, and we'll come back to you, Paul. Uh, just uh, on the site that will be directed to sign up for an enrollment if you wish to get some newsletter information specific to professional development. So the information is there for you and it's on this whiteboard as well. But let me turn it over to uh, to you, Paul, and say, first of all, on behalf of the group, thank you so much. So let's do some Q&A here. Sounds good. Happy to answer any questions or uh, talk to anyone about any aspect of this.